Struggling to connect a wired Ethernet device to your home network without running long cables? A wired-to-wireless bridge is a quick fix. Stick around to see three easy DIY options. And the best part? You don't have to spend a lot. Ever found yourself needing to connect to a wired Ethernet device, but the router is too far away? Maybe it's a smart TV in the living room, a game console in the basement, or even a security camera out in the garage. Whatever the case, you're stuck with a device that only takes a wired connection, but you need it to work over Wi-Fi because running a cable just isn't an option. So what can you do? A wired to wireless Ethernet bridge could be exactly what you need. And the best part, it doesn't have to cost you a fortune. How do you decide which method is right for you? I will show and explain five different ways of building and installing a Wi-Fi to Ethernet bridge. In order to understand why you might need one, what it does, and how it works, I need to explain the difference between a network switch and a network bridge. When people start talking about networking gear, one of the first confusing topics is the difference between a network switch and a network bridge. The simple answer is that a switch is just a type of bridge. Right now, you're probably upset that like many other techies, I just explained something unclear in terms of something else that is also confusing, which, of course, is no explanation at all. Not really helpful, right? So before diving into the how-to of a wireless-to-wired Ethernet bridge, let's briefly go over some networking concepts. I apologize for getting into professor mode here, but the key to having a successful smart home is building a rock-solid networking foundation as everything runs on top of the network itself. So my biggest secret tip for mastering your own smart home is to challenge yourself to learn and understand a bit of the esoteric and confusing networking technology that powers everything you actually enjoy using. The diagram on the screen is the ISO OSI model for networking that has been widely adopted by all modern networking technologies. That's a mouthful. Let me break it down for you. ISO means International Standards Organization. That's a stuffy committee of nerds from around the world that set standards for all kinds of things, including health, safety, and industrial standards. So, yep, the same group that sets world standards for toilet seats that's ISO standard 17966 colon 2016, if you're interested, is also responsible for the OSI, or Open Systems Interconnection, standard model for communication networks. The trick to understanding the OSI networking model is to realize it follows the first law of engineering. Any successful model must take a complicated subject and make it even harder to understand. And for extra credit, be sure and call anything complicated simple, just to insult the 99% of us that have trouble understanding it. Just kidding. Or am I? If you think I'm kidding, just look up SMTP, the Simple Message Transfer Protocol for email, or SNMP, the Simple Network Management Protocol for network equipment. Neither are really all that simple. So the OSI model is a fancy and complicated way to explain how a communications network should be designed and operate, but it does have one simple concept at the core. Network communications is complicated and confusing, so break it down to a series of simpler steps. It's really just the classic human problem-solving approach of divide and conquer. Each layer can involve hardware, software, or both. With well-defined boundaries between the layers, each layer can be designed by different engineers, and then hooked up together more easily. I'm going to skip over a lot of details. As shown in the diagram, the OSI model has seven layers, but we only need to pay attention right now to the bottommost layer one and layer two. That's because network switches and bridges operate only on these two layers and are oblivious to everything higher up. Layer one is the physical layer, hardware and transmission. This layer is responsible for the physical connection between devices and the transmission of raw data. Layer two is the data link layer. This layer deals with the connection between two devices. If you want to send data somewhere, you gotta start with one device, a sender, 
being able to actually send the data to somewhere. I like to explain it this way. It's like how the postal system works. First, we write a letter that we want to send to someone. This is layer one, the physical layer. Then we place the letter into an envelope and write the address of where we want the letter to go on the outside of the envelope. This is layer two, the connection layer. Think about it. The mailbox where we drop the letter for delivery, the post office, the mail truck, the postal delivery carrier at the final destination have everything they need to do their job on the outside of the envelope. Like the OSI model at layer two, the post office system never looks inside the envelope. It's only when finally delivered that the recipient will open the envelope, look at its contents, and then has to understand the words or symbols on the paper. So what is the real difference between a network switch and a network bridge? They're both crucial components in home and office networks, but usually they serve different functions. A switch is like a traffic director, managing and routing the flow of data within the same kind of network. A specific wired network such as ethernet or wireless network, a bridge, on the other hand, connects different kinds of network segments. A switch mainly operates within a single kind of network. A bridge spans across different media types, individually or many at the same time. Makes sense? If you are following along, then you've probably figured out that a bridge could also connect wired ethernet to wired ethernet or wireless Wi-Fi to another Wi-Fi network too, just like a switch, right? So why do we use more special purpose switches at all when bridges can do everything? That's a good question. The short answer is we could use bridges to do everything. Switches are specially designed to do what they do and can do it light years faster, better, and cheaper than bridges. And therefore, they're widely used whenever possible. Now that you understand why and when a bridge is needed, let's dive into five easy and affordable ways to set one up in our home networks. Option one, use a consumer mesh point. You might already have this option sitting around your house. Many popular mesh Wi-Fi systems already support wired to wireless bridging through their ethernet ports. Some examples of consumer mesh products include Eero and Eero Pro, Google Wi-Fi, Netgear Orbi, TP-Link Deco, and Linksys Velop wireless routers. These systems almost always have devices with Ethernet ports and support a wireless mesh. That means they connect wirelessly to each other and don't have to be wired to a single central location. That's really important for many home or apartment installations where you simply don't have existing Ethernet wiring and either can't or don't want to install it. Once you have one of these systems working, the extra Ethernet ports on each device they usually have at least one, but sometimes two or more, can then be used to bridge anything you wish to connect that has only a wired Ethernet connection. This is the simplest bridge solution, but is often overlooked. You're probably thinking, well, duh, that's the whole point of using them. Yes, I agree. But you'd be surprised how many homeowners only use mesh Wi-Fi to provide wireless connections for Wi-Fi to their smartphones, tablets, and laptops and don't realize they can also be used as bridges to connect anything with only an ethernet port. Option two, use a travel router. If you're looking for something more portable and budget friendly, a travel router is a great option. It's probably not what you would reach for when thinking about setting up a bridge, but hear me out. These small devices are inexpensive and easy to set up with a straightforward web interface. They run off a USB power cable, so it is easy to get them powered up from what you already have at home. The secret sauce is that most travel routers support different modes of operation. They can do a lot more than just act as a miniature version of your standard home router connecting you to the internet. When you choose a travel router, the key is to figure out if it supports what I call client bridge mode, the ability to act as a tiny bridge device linking a Wi-Fi device to a wired ethernet network. The magic is we want to use client bridge mode backwards. Instead of connecting a Wi-Fi device like a smartphone or laptop to an existing wired ethernet network, such as in a hotel room, 
we want to reverse that and connect the travel router using Wi-Fi to our existing home network and then use the bridged Ethernet port to connect devices like a streaming TV, printer, or home automation hub. So a travel router can be a versatile solution, especially if you need something quick and easy to set up. Option three, build a DIY wireless bridge. This is a do-it-yourself version of the previous two options. Using a combination of gear you might already own, build a client device bridge between Ethernet and Wi-Fi. I work a lot with Ubiquiti Unify networking gear, so I'm going to show how I've done this with their products. With a bit of research and creativity, you should be able to do something similar with other brands. The heart of this wireless bridge is a Unify APEC access point. It's a high-performance Wi-Fi access point with two built-in Ethernet ports. When used normally, the PoE or Power Over Ethernet port is connected to the wired network, providing electrical power to operate the access point and the data connection from the router. So the access point provides Wi-Fi wireless connectivity and works like any regular access point. Now the secondary Ethernet port, which is not PoE enabled, can be connected to any desired Ethernet device, such as a printer, TV, or streaming media box. With this setup, we've got a wired Ethernet bridge. The key is we're going to convert this to a wireless bridge by disconnecting the incoming Ethernet line from the access point. This can work because all currently supported Unify access points can work as wireless mesh points. Even without the words mesh in the product name, they are capable of establishing a wireless uplink into the existing network. There's only one problem. The incoming PoE connection was providing both network data over Ethernet and power over Ethernet to operate the access point. Without that cable, the Unify access point cannot power up. The solution is straightforward. We just use a standalone PoE injector connected to that PoE input port on the access point to provide the needed power. A PoE injector is just a power supply that plugs into any AC wall outlet and supplies low voltage DC power via an Ethernet cable instead of a USB cable. A typical PoE injector costs around $20 and will do the job nicely. Essentially, we've replaced the need for an Ethernet wire to run all the way back to the main network equipment area with simply having a nearby AC power outlet where we can plug in a PoE injector with a short Ethernet cable used only as a power cord. As before, the second Ethernet jack on the access point is used to connect to a single Ethernet device. We can also connect that to a small Ethernet switch and that allows more than one device to be bridged at the same time. Although this is a fun way to build a bridge, I do feel the need to rain on our parade with a few warnings. In researching this, I found that Unify has discontinued the wireless access point I am using because they replaced it with newer models that support Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 6E, or Wi-Fi 7. That's fine, but their new lineup of access points only have a single Ethernet port, so it's not possible to configure them as bridges anymore. Second, this DIY approach really works best if you already own some of the equipment. If you actually have to go out and buy all the parts, it's probably going to be more expensive than any of the other options. Lastly, the final result is truly a Rube Goldberg setup with multiple boxes, power cords, and cables. It's a rat's nest of connections, and that might be the polite summary. So I think this bridge option can be a great learning tool or leftover parts bin weekend project, but I wouldn't give this a lot of consideration otherwise. Option four, use a Raspberry Pi or equivalent. For the full do-it-yourself enthusiast, setting up a Raspberry Pi as a Wi-Fi to Ethernet bridge is a fun project. It's ideal if you already own a Raspberry Pi and are familiar with Linux or Unix operating systems. The Raspberry Pi can be configured as a transparent layer 2 bridge, meaning it doesn't create a new subnet or interfere with your existing router. This is just another variation of what we've already done. Instead of being hardware-centric, this approach requires more operating system software hands-on. While the setup might be a bit more technical, it gives you full control over the details. 
Just keep in mind you need a Raspberry Pi configuration that includes both wired Ethernet and Wi-Fi hardware, so you might need to buy an add-on daughter board for your Pi to add the needed hardware interface, as many Pis come with only a wired Ethernet interface and not both. Configuration consists of transferring the operating system image to an SD card memory card, booting up the system, going through the standard setup and adjustments, and then delving into the command line to install additional networking software and configure the network interfaces and bridging features. Are your eyes glazing over? Don't worry. I'm not going through the detailed steps any further. There's lots of information available online with step-by-step -step directions on how to do this. Option five is really a bonus tip. Buy a purpose-built wireless bridge. If all the previous methods seem a bit clunky or complicated, I've got good news. Plug and play turnkey wireless to ethernet bridges are now available as consumer products. In the past, buying a ready-to-go network bridge kit might cost several thousand dollars. They were sold for outdoor long-distance use and often involved expensive microwave or other radio transmission systems with finicky dish antennas that had to be carefully aligned to establish a strong line-of-sight connection. That's all changed. You can choose from multiple self-contained retail wireless bridge products available at affordable prices, some of which include the Ubiquiti Unified Device Bridge for $99 or the Unified Device Bridge Pro for $199, the TP-Link Amata Bridge Kit for $140, the TrendNet Outdoor Pre-Configured Point-to-Point -point Bridge Kit for $249, or the Kufi Wireless Bridge Kit for only $59. I'll put the product names and model information in the description below. These are plug and play solutions with some rated for indoor use only, others for both indoors and outdoors. Some include a pair of devices to work as a self-contained full bridge. Others rely on using your existing Wi-Fi or wired ethernet network on one side of the bridged connection. To wrap up, let's recap. What's the difference between a switch and a bridge? A switch manages multiple similar connections. A bridge connects between different transport media, such as wired and wireless hardware. Why use a Wi-Fi to Ethernet bridge? A wired to wireless Ethernet bridge can solve many home networking challenges. Whether you're trying to extend your network to a distant room or converting a wired-only device to work with your Wi-Fi network, a bridge is a solution you need. From consumer mesh points, repurposed travel routers, DIY Raspberry Pi projects, reused older Wi-Fi access points, or affordable plug-and-play bridges, there's a solution for every situation and budget. Got your local bridge working? Great, but why stop there? Learn how to access your home network from anywhere in the world by watching this video next.